I'm Barry Kibrick, and I want to thank all of you who have been tuning into our show via YouTube. As a staple on PBS, I'm so grateful that you can now see our full episodes online. I hope you're enjoying them, and please subscribe to our channel so I can continue to make them available to all. Thank you. Since the beginning of mankind, the planet Mars has captured our attention. Over the millenniums, we've gone from its myth to its exploration. Now with my guest Rod Pyle, a writer for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, we explore the next step with his book, Mars, Making Contact. It seems like it's been a while, but welcome back to Between the Lines to our new studio. It's a pleasure to have you here, my friend. It's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. I love it. Uh, well, thank you. I want to start with your words, Mars, and by the way, not only your words, but all of our words, Mars has always held a special place in the human psyche. And you take us through the history from the earliest man to the most recent of NASA and JPL's vision and yet it's always been there hasn't it in our mind as well as physically yeah for the ancients mars was a real puzzle because when you if you imagine yourself back in prehistoric times uh you walk outside if you were brave enough most people didn't after dark get away from the campfire and here's this spectacle of stars overhead thousands of them and then they began to notice that a few moved differently than the others, and those are the planets. But the one that always stood out was Mars, for two reasons. One, it was red, which of course, back then, because you saw more of it, you associated it with blood and death and mayhem. And also because it had unusual notions. It does this retrograde movement every couple of seasons. So it became a real puzzle in their minds, and throughout cultures up through the medieval era, Mars was typically associated with blood and war. Uh, oh, and the god of war, Mars, right? That's right. How they, yeah, that's how it all The Romans worked. dug that. Now, what you tell us, though, it is in many ways similar to Earth in geology and physics, yet the atmosphere completely different. And that's the baffling things. And the first thing we learn about Mars is the atmosphere because we don't even penetrate it. We're just flying by and seeing it. But that's what's very different, what will make it difficult for man, if they can colonize it, to live there, wouldn't it? Yeah, Mars is kind of the forlorn trailer park to Earth's Brentwood, you know? <laughs> it's the other planet that didn't do quite so well. Uh, early on, it was very wet, it was warm, it was fairly verdant, actually, a few billion years ago. We only know this recently because the Curiosity rover and some of the newer orbiters have been sending back data that shows that it had a very wet, drenched period when it had a denser atmosphere than it does today. But that atmosphere began to disappear a few billion years ago, and the water dried up and froze. There's still actually a w lot of water on Mars, enough to cover it to a depth of 30 to 50 feet pole to pole, but it's locked up in the polar caps and in large glacier areas. So you could have that Mars back, and guys like Elon Musk have talked about that, about terraforming Mars. A lot of people talked about terraforming Mars. He just happened to talk about doing it with nuclear warheads, which probably won't happen. Oh, thank God. Uh, leaving Earth, you say, was simple. The problem is when you have to navigate to the planet itself, because every people, it, it, it's, it's hard to understand, I guess, but you know, everything is moving. So you're moving, Mars is moving, trajectories are almost impossible to, I don't know, the, the minds at JPL and Caltech it's, are just, yeah. you know, it's unbelievable for how they can figure this out. And also, you can't even leave for Mars except every two years due to, I guess, a variety of reasons that I can't fathom. But it's, so it's, it's, it's one thing to fly, it's another thing to land and get there. It's very complicated, and it, it took a long time to fully understand the physics of that. Um, certainly in the in 16, 1700s, they're beginning to realize, okay, this isn't what we used to think it was. They had all these complicated schemes worked out. But you're right, it's every two years is the proper departure window, and it's because these orbits are elliptical and offset from each other, so you have to do it at just the right time that you've got the minimum transfer distance from one to the other, because you're not going in a straight line. You're really just taking a larger orbit than the Earth's and extending it out until you intersect with Mars. And yet, 
you go to JPL, and they're they're talking about you know intersecting the planet's orbit or making a landing within a matter of miles or less, not hundreds or thousands of miles like you'd think. And yet, on Earth, that difference could be literally, if I'm correct, a fraction, fraction, fraction of an inch on Earth that then equates to hundreds and thousands of miles because of, again, the distance traveled and the trajectory. Right, so the, the errors are magnified. So if you, if you have an error here, it's gonna be much worse out there. Of course, they can correct along the way because they do have rocket propulsion to do that. But this is the same thing we see with trying to defend the Earth from asteroids. When you're talking about things coming the other direction, you wanna find them early enough and nudge them off course soon enough that that'll be magnified and hopefully they'll miss the Earth. So that works both directions, thank goodness. Now we talked about the atmosphere. The way we learned about the atmosphere was what the first missions were and that was just to fly by the planet and they couldn't even see anything because the atmosphere was thick and dusty and gosh knows what was in it. But then Mariner 9 becomes the first spacecraft to actually orbit another planet and even though they're uh, uh, i'm assuming they're orbiting it above the atmosphere still mm -hmm. am i correct yes but it still is giving them a chance now because they're orbiting it times when the atmosphere now clears up a little bit they're able to sort of get a, a glimpse a little better isn't that correct on, on, the, on the first time we start orbiting a Early. planet yeah they got very lucky on mariner 9. mariner 4 went up in 1965 and i was a young man then so at that point those of us who were romantics felt there was still a chance that the ideas of people like Percival Lowell, that there might be canals and Martians, probably not, but there might be plants. We didn't know. We'd only seen it through a telescope. So 1965 was the first flyby, first successful mission, an American mission, and we got back 22 pictures of this desolate, frozen, crater-covered planet that looked like the moon. It was, I mean, for the layman, it was kind of heartbreaking, right? Because all these romantic notions went poof in a moment. For the scientists, it was a bonanza. So then two more mariners went by in the uh, mid-60s and um, sent back many more hundreds of photographs. We were beginning to get, these were flybys. It was 1971 when Mariner 9 went that you're talking about where they went into orbit. For the first month and a half or so that they were there, there was this global dust storm. Now the Russians had sent, the Soviets had sent a couple of spacecraft at the same time. They were set up to automatically just start shooting when they arrived. So they shot the dust storm, which looked like a big red billiard ball for a month and then went offline. Uh, the American probe Mariner, they're able to reprogram and say, okay, let's wait out the dust storm. Then they started taking images after about four to six weeks. And the first thing they saw in this featureless expanse of red were these three little dots. And they couldn't figure out what they were. They realized they were these enormous volcanoes that were poking up through this layer of dust. And we began to realize it's called the Tharsis Bulge. It's this huge mound on the planet with these volcanoes on it. Then bit by bit, as you said, it cleared up and they were finally able to photograph the entire planet over the course of a year. Well, two things you just brought up that makes this interesting. What, what really still was driving us was not just Mars, but it was the space competition with the Soviets. Yeah. That's, I mean, it, it's, it's funny, we, we, we look at economics and things like that, but competition still does make for one person to try better than the other to achieve something. And America, like you said, what was, I don't know if you, you said it here, but in, in the book especially, you let us know that we had the sense to make this reprogrammable, the computer reprogrammable that allowed us to, like you say, wait out the storms. But what I was amazed when you said those volcanoes, we're talking mountains that are 16 miles in the air, or not in the air, in the Mars atmosphere, Thin air, that's yeah. three times the size of our Mount Everest and things like that. So these are gigantic structures. Yeah, Olympus Mons, I think, is the size of the state of Arizona, and Nevada put together or something. It's huge. It's a huge shield volcano. Jumping back for a second, this was the other space race. So we had the Apollo versus the Soyuz, American versus Soviet race to the moon, which we were victorious in. And then at the same time, we had these planetary robotic missions going up, and the Russians launched a lot more spacecraft than we did. Uh, we've had about a 70, 72% success rate with Mars because it's tough. They've had zero over 50 years. Well, a concern I had, though, in reading the book was you mentioned specifically how concerned NASA and JPL and everyone was 
on not to let any germs whatsoever mm. penetrate the Martian atmosphere or their soil or anything. Do we know if the Soviets at that time or Russia now are paying that same type of attention? Because as you said, if, if even just a droplet of any form of biological material somehow gets on Mars, it will give us misinformation about is there life or not? It could. Actually, they're realizing now there's so much radiation and the, the chemistry of the soil is so harsh it's laced with perchlorate, which is very uh, reactive. So probably given those conditions, it's not as bad as we thought, but Viking was sterilized the nth degree. It's still the gold standard. Nothing is more thrilling to a planetary scientist than new questions to be answered. One of those questions was the planet still alive? That was one of the first things we wanted to know, because like you said, we had visions of water being there, canals, all sorts of things was life on this planet was one of the one of the first driving forces the second was find the water mm -hmm. and finding the water really began to come to the fore after pathfinder so uh, let me just step back a little bit mariner 9 1971 we'd finally gone to orbit around the planet and we knew there were craters and mountains and volcanoes, but what we began to see with Mariner 9 were things that looked like water features. And this was puzzling, because we thought this was a dry, dead world. We expected the wind-sculpted plains of the America Southwest, but we saw what were obviously river deltas and things that were sculpted by huge flowing amounts of water over many, many millennia. And this was puzzling, because this is not a watery planet from what we could tell. So. Once we got Pathfinder up there in 1997 and then the Mars Exploration Rovers in 2004, they were able to really begin this program of look for the water, follow the water, quote unquote. And mostly at that point, that was about looking for minerals that had clearly been formed in the presence of water a long time ago. Now we're actually beginning to see water active on the planet in brief periods of time from orbit. Well, even within NASA and JPL though, there's according to you, a, a sort of battle that goes on between the meteorologists and the geologists. Yes. They have different needs and both feel each one of theirs is the most important need. And, and, and yet you, you do want to, you want to do both. You want to find out about their, their weather, their, uh, their climate, all of that, but you also want to get into that soil and look at those, if there are minerals in there that can sustain life, if there will, and life sciences. There's another part, so you've got three of these, and probably, if I'm, I'm sure there's, there's a thousand yeah, more type yeah. of sciences as well, but you can see them all trying to fight for a piece of the action. What's the rover going to do? What's the Pathfinder going to do? Is it going to check the soil? Is it going to check the air? Is it going to look for water? It's, the tasks are amazing. Yeah, and deciding where it's going to land, you've got this tension between the engineers saying, okay, we want a nice, flat, safe place where it could set down and uh, rove and do its thing. And you've got the geologists saying, no, we want some interesting rocks. Well, that means that they're all jumbled up and water torn and so forth. And then if there's a life science package, you've got those people saying, no, we want an area that promises interesting biology and a way to get to it, or at least the potential for it. So you've got those tensions. Then when you begin getting results back, so Curiosity has been there now since 2012, right? You're starting to get back a lot of data. They're up to about 550 feet elevation off the crater floor of Gale Crater. You're building up this huge database of, of what's in the crater floor, that old lake bed there, and as you move up all the strata that you're looking at, you're getting this real picture of what this environment was like. So the geologists are saying, geologists are saying here's how wet it was then, here's when it dried up, here's the amount of salt in the soil, and the meteorology guys are saying uh, that doesn't really match the, the model that we've made. And the geologist is saying, that's the evidence. And the meteorologist is saying, hmm, <laughs> I have to go back to the drawing, drawing board. Oh. So it's a really, it's a wonderful time that it's in this much flux, because for a long time it wasn't. Well, but, and here comes the other big question. You ask, you answer it once, and then you ask it another time, is that after the Viking mission, it took us 15 years to go back. And I, I know a lot of it has to do with even what we're dealing with now is how when you have, quote unquote, so many issues on Earth, do you spend so much money going to Mars? And right. this has been a constant battle that NASA's been dealing with. And yet, 
when pe what people don't realize is that I don't want to say every single bit of modern technology came out of these kinds of things, but a heck of a lot of everything we're capable of doing in the modern world came from the exploration that NASA started. Yes, that digital pad and the phone in my pocket are both directly related back to the Apollo program because that was a quantum leap in integrated circuits and computing. It's also worth mentioning, there's this notion that every penny NASA spends got shoveled into a spacecraft and launched into space, it's all spent on the ground. It pays engineers, it pays metallurgy people, it pays kids to go to school, it pays the guy slinging hash down the street. That money goes into our economy, and the space program is still one of the few things that America does better than almost anybody, and all the money is spent here on citizens and immigrants who are working in the program, going to school, and it's putting people right where we need them, in the sciences, in engineering, in computing, and so it's a real net win all the way around, but it's also hard to communicate that sometimes. One last thing I'll say is, there's a popular conception that NASA gets between five and 10% of the national, the federal budget. Oh, gosh. At the height of the space program, in the Apollo days of 66, it was up to 5%. Now it's a tenth of that, it's a half of 1%. So it's a real small amount of money, and back then they were doing one man space program, the effort to get to the moon, and a couple of robotic programs. Now they've got 20 or 30. We've got a whole cluster of spacecraft orbiting and driving on Mars. We've got Voyager that's left the solar system. We're still tracking that. We've got all these Earth observation satellites, and oh yes, a space station going overhead every 90 minutes and working with the private sector to get rockets up there, which is really exciting. And again, what I think people need to know is under the worst case scenario, if we don't do this and humanity wants to survive, it may have to survive someplace else. We don't hope it ever takes place, but we have to be prepared for that. Well, and that's what really drives people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. You know, NASA's got its own fish to fry and limited budget to do so, and they're trying to do a lot with what money they've got. And we've got this big mega rocket they're building, the SLS and the Orion capsule. Not sure what's going to happen with that under the current administration, the new administration. But then you've got Elon Musk, who in 10 years, 12 years, has gone from a rich kid who said, hey, Air Force and NASA, I'm going to build rockets and launch the satellites. And I said, yeah, that's nice. Well, he's doing it. And not only that, they fly themselves back to home base. I mean, how amazing is that? And his stated goal is to make a backup drive for Earth, if you will. Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame is building his own rockets. He wants to do orbital tourism. He wants to do space stations. He also wants to do colonies, but he wants to do colonies in space. So it apparently is going to take these billionaire Tony Stark types to come along and say, okay, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it. Now, they, SpaceX gets a lot of money from NASA, don't get me wrong. They are on big contracts along with Boeing and the United Launch Alliance to send material up to the space station and back, but that seed money was his and that drive and that, that design is his. There still is mystery though, and you call it the galactic ghoul. And uh, it's no matter how smart we all think we are and no matter how much Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos Cosmos sometimes likes to play tricks on everyone, and the galactic ghoul is just that. It's sort of the, a term used for, how the heck did that go wrong? <laughs> yes, and it's interesting, as a writer, when you try and track down the sources of these things, and you find three primary references in that period that disagree, but I finally met the guy who coined the term. His name's John Cassani, he's an engineer started back in the Mariner days and only, I don't even, he's officially retired, but he still works at JPL Projects. He's just one of those chronic overachievers who came up with that as a crack while he was talking to a reporter from the Times, I think, who said, look, half the stuff we send to Mars doesn't make it, which is, if you take everybody's programs into account, it still kind of holds true. What's going on? And he kind of chuckled and said, maybe there's a, a great galactic ghoul out there intercepting our spacecraft. And then some artist made this wonderful painting of this big pink polka dotted thing drifting out in space, picking its teeth with a piece of a Mariner spacecraft. So you got to have an explanation, you know. You do something interesting in the book, though, that I wanted to, sh because I, if I if I only saw it once, I would have ignored it, but I saw it twice, and 
it was references to ballet and dance. I, I know that sounds strange, but you say, and you use these terms, an intricate orbital ballet, communicating with the rovers, always required some choreography. And a few <laughs> times through, I noticed that, and, and there was a sense of, of beauty when you, you wrote about it that way, because we think of it always as a, a hard science. Mm -hmm. And what most people, I, I think, don't realize is, yes, there's a tremendous amount of hard science. You can't get there without it. But there's a lot of poetry, a lot of beauty. And if it wasn't even for the thought experiments of people like Einstein and people like that, we wouldn't have even had the capacity to figure these things out. So oftentimes, we leave out some of the ancillary but yet equally important notions of what is required, the art, the, the creativity, all of the things besides the hard sciences. I think part of that, and I'm so glad you noticed it, they're kind of tucked in there, I think part of that comes from spending time at JPL, which I do, and seeing these passionate, brilliant people I mean, they're smart enough, there's heat waves radi radiating off their heads sometimes, I think. So I'm sitting in a room full of people having a meeting about bringing down data from Curiosity. I've just upped the age to average by walking in by about 25 years, because they're probably in their mid-20s to early 30s, and they're brilliant, and they are passionate, and they are driven. So that's part of the artfulness of it. And also, my mother was a ballerina, my dad was a classical musician, so I was raised around that stuff. So I think uh. that's where that sort of gets woven in there. And to tell you the truth, I didn't even realize I was doing it until you just brought it up. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm glad, so I, I'm glad I found it in there because it is there and I think it's important for it to be there because we, we don't want to lose sight of that. There is still a poetry involved to going to this planet. There's a, another thing though, and you, you mentioned curiosity because <laughs> obviously that has a double-edged sword itself. This mm -hmm. whole thing wouldn't exist if we humans weren't made of curiosity, so to speak. But in this particular case, there's a, a philosophical underpinning. And it, in my opinion is, this is the time we start to drill. And I like to think of us as we're drilling as a way of saying we're going deeper. We're going deeper into not just the planet, but deeper into the, the entire philosophy of what it means to be on another planet, to be so intimately connected with the cosmos. I think you're right. Since 1976, the first time we landed there, we were staring at the surface. So 76 with Viking, you had a scoop that could reach out about 10 feet and a sweep about 90 degrees and pick up sand. But if there was a rock 20 feet over there, all you could do is stare at it. Then you start sending rovers. They can drive up to rocks, they can sniff them with their little sensors, they can scrape them clean, but you still can't go below the surface except whatever you can scrape up with your little shovel. Here comes Curiosity with a drill that not only spins but hammers, so you're able to actually grind up. You can dig a hole, it's about the size of a dime, maybe goes down, I don't know, four or five inches, and you can dig up powder from that and examine that. But now with the 2020 rover, which is going up in three years, you're going to be able to drill core samples. So you'll actually be able to pull up a chunk of dirt in a tube, a metal tube, and evaluate that. And then they're actually going to store some of them for eventual return to Earth, but they still have to find the money to do that. As grand as we believe computers are and all of the technology, none of it would be done as quickly as if a man or woman themselves was not on that planet. Mankind still is the preeminent mind that can figure things out and do things. But if you talk to somebody like Steve Squires, who was the guy in charge of the Mars Exploration Rovers in the 2000s, he said, look, if I had a geologist up there, they could do this stuff that this rover's done in 10 years in about three days, or maybe a week, because they adapt, they can move around, they can make random decisions, they see something fascinating, they just go over and take care of it, and they don't break. They keep going. So even though we're basically bags of water and flesh and space really hates us, it tries to find a lot of ways to, to be unkind to you when you're up there between radiation and temperature and vacuum and all that. Still, ultimately, I think it's genuinely agreed, not just for scientific reasons, but for more poetic and prosaic and romantic reasons. It makes a difference to humanity when you see it through the eyes of another human being. And that's going to be a big moment. 
Rod, our time is up, and I want to thank you for letting us see it through your eyes and shedding so much light on Mars and someday making contact. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure, and thank you for joining us. Now, before Rod leaves, I want to leave you with these few more words from Mars making contact. Few things in space exploration are simple, and often any questions answered end up prompting even more. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between all our unanswered questions are the reasons we must always keep exploring our outer space and our inner space as well. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Sam Ash Music, a proud sponsor of Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. Sam Ash has been serving musicians since 1924. To unlock your inner musician, information is available at samash.com.